All right, so this evening we're returning to Ephesians chapter 6. I'd like to read as we begin verses uh, 10 through uh, 20. We did look at verse 10 uh, this morning. Uh, We're going to be looking at uh, the rest of the text, um, uh, not so much in verses 19 and 20, but um, verses 11 through 18. This is what Paul writes, again, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing. I should mention that, um, you know, there's been a lot written on this particular text. And I can't help but uh, mention one particularly important work by William Gurnall called The Christian in Complete Armor. You know, we're talking here about 11 verses of Scripture. Actually, I'm not sure if he covers 19 and 20. Perhaps he does. And I think he writes 1,200 pages of commentary on those verses. And if you look through it, it's, well, it's, it's a manual on spiritual warfare. And it also is not, as you might suspect, a book that long on, on so few verses. It's not really redundant. It's, um, it is quite an interesting book. It's a book that um, John Newton said that if he had to be stranded on a desert island and he could only have one other book besides the Bible, that is the book that he would take with him. Um, There's also another small book by Thomas Brooks called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, much smaller, uh, and also a very good work on the subject. So all that to say that we're only going to scratch the surface of everything that uh, might be said from this particular passage. Now this morning, remember, we were looking at that battle that all of us are actually involved in, uh, the one that is going on all around us, all the time, and again, not just around us, but also in us. And we also saw what it is that needs to be true of us if in this battle we are to be conquerors and not those who are continually defeated. The first thing that Paul told us is we need to be strong. Now remember, he wasn't talking about physical strength primarily, although physical strength is important, but he was talking about spiritual strength. We don't have the strength that we need. And even as we saw, coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, we have an initial amount of strength given to us by the Holy Spirit, but not enough to fight in this battle, which is why Paul tells us that we need to look to Jesus, to be strong in Him, to strengthen ourselves in Him. He is the one who has the resources that we need. He is the one with irresistible divine and sovereign power, which he makes available to us through his Holy Spirit so that we will have strength, courage to overcome our fears, strength to resist temptation, power to do what he calls us to do, as well as the willingness to suffer what we must in this path of duty. But there are other things that we need besides this internal strength. We also need a strong defense. We need the armor that the Lord has provided. And we need a strong offense that the Lord has given us through the word 
and prayer. So this evening, we're going to look at those two things, the defensive armor and the offensive weapon. So first of all, let's look at the armor that the Lord has provided. Uh, but before we do, let me just note a couple of things. The first is, like the strength that we need not being physical, so this armor is not physical but is spiritual. This armor that Paul calls the armor of God. In his description of it, he basically explains it as several spiritual blessings or virtues that the Lord provides through his Son. And if we strip away the armor um, analogy for just a moment, they're basically these. Truth, righteousness, um, having the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace is kind of open for interpretation, but we'll just say confidence that the gospel is the only way of salvation, faith, hope, the word of God, and prayer. Uh, these are spiritual things. Some of them are spiritual virtues that are given to us uh, by uh, the Spirit of God, and other things are tools that he gives to us in which to use. Now, this armor needs to be spiritual because it is meant to be a defense against spiritual enemies, as Paul lists them out, the devil, who is real. The rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Our fight, he says, is not against flesh and blood. It's not against mankind. As a matter of fact, mankind are the ones we're sent out to bring the gospel to that they might be saved. Sometimes it appears as though it is against mankind. It is against flesh and blood since our true enemy has the ability to influence people, what men do, and get them to basically come against us. But our true battle is against the kingdom of darkness, against the devil and his demons. The second thing to note here is that Paul tells us if we are to stand against this enemy, we have to put this armor on and we have to have all of it. He says in verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Now, one thing I should mention is this. As we examine the armor, which we're going to do in just a moment, we're going to see that all of these things are things that the Spirit of God is working in us. They are things that he gives to us simply by the fact that, his, that he's present within our souls. If we have him, we already have the whole package. We already have this, this whole armor. But Paul is telling us, in another sense, there's something we need to do, and that is we need to put this armor on. Same thing as we saw this morning. We may possess the parts of this armor. We may possess strength already by the Holy Spirit, but we still need to work at developing these things, at strengthening these things. We need to work with God, be filled with His Holy Spirit, so that we might grow stronger in all of these spiritual virtues. So it's true we have the whole package, but Paul says we need to put on or develop those different areas. It's, it's like we already have the Spirit of Christ living in us. In a certain sense, we are already something like Him, and yet we're commanded in Scripture to put on the Lord Jesus Christ to become more like Him. So we're talking here again about sanctification, the work that we do along with the Lord to grow in these different areas. So now let's take a look at the armor. What, what is it? Well, Paul describes it in terms of armor that was used in his day, armor used by the Romans as a belt, a breastplate, the sandals, a shield, a helmet, and a sword, although the sword's really part of the offensive weaponry. Now, I should mention at the beginning, it, it's not entirely clear in, in every case whether Paul is assigning a particular spiritual virtue to the particular piece of armor that he does because that part reflects perhaps the same thing in the physical realm that that virtue does in the spiritual realm, 
We don't know if there's a one-to-one -one correlation like that. In some cases, clearly, there are. But in other cases, it's not entirely clear. So as we look at it, we'll, we'll try to draw analogies as they exist, perhaps. And perhaps you know some that I'm not aware of. But the important thing is that we see the virtue that the Lord is calling us to put on, not whether or not we see the correlation with the armor. So what is it that he tells us to put on? Well, first of all, he tells us in verse 14 that we need to gird our loins with truth. Not the way we actually um, would say it today. Perhaps it means put on your belt and tighten it, you know. Uh, wrap up, as it were, your garments or hold up, hold up part of your garments with, with this belt. He's talking about a sash, the belt or the waistband that the soldier would use to tie up his robe so that he could move more freely and the belt also which, in which he would put his sword. Now some suggest that he refers to truth as a belt because truth is something we need to keep close to us. But we could really say that about the other parts as well. I mean, all these things are things we need to keep close to us. Maybe he means the whole of our armor is held together by God's truth in the same way the belt kind of holds everything uh, together in a certain sense. And, and certainly that is true. The Spirit uses the truth to kind of, well, to, to help us develop in the areas, to show us what it is that the Lord wants us to become and to continually direct us that way to keep us on the right path. Or he may be drawing our attention to the connection between uh, truth, the belt, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, because they are essentially the same thing. Now again, the relationship of truth to a belt may not necessarily be clear, but it certainly is clear that God's truth is important and we need to hold it close to us. As we were encouraged a few weeks ago, Paul tells us, or commands us really, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. And we saw that that translation really wasn't quite strong enough. What he was saying is the word of Christ must live richly within you. We are to be saturated with God's truth. The Word is the standard that the Lord has given to us. In the terms of, of, you know, let's say military terms, it is our marching orders, our strategy for the battle. The Lord calls us to know His Word, to hold on to the Word, to judge everything that we believe by the Word, everything we do by that standard, and we are commanded here not to let anything take it from us, but hold it close. You know, as you look in the Old Testament, we saw the Lord commanding the Jews, you know, take, take the law. And he says, write it on your doorpost, put it on the lintels of your house, bind it on your forehead. And the Jews literally did that. They made what's called a phylactery with a leather strap, and they strapped it onto their forehead, a little box that had a scripture in it that said that you're supposed to bind this to your forehead. <laughs> Now, the Lord tells us that we are to take his truth and bind it around our waist. And he doesn't mean take a belt and strap a Bible to you. But what he does mean is know the Bible and hold fast to that truth and don't let anything take it away from you. Remember it. Know it, remember it, and do it. Secondly, he says in verse 14 that we are to put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate, as you know, is a metal plate usually made of iron or bronze, covers the chest. It's meant to protect the vital organs from perhaps projectiles or uh, thrusts from a sword or a spear. Righteousness here can refer to several things, but in the context, I think we can narrow it down to two. And I think Paul means either, and actually this isn't either or, it's really both and, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ the righteousness that the Father gives to us is a free gift. The, the righteousness He gives to us by faith when we trust in His Son. The righteousness by which we are justified or made right in God's eyes and accepted into His family. That, I believe, is that righteousness. But I think He's also referring to the practice of righteousness. Living a holy life according to God's standard of righteousness. Because how can you separate the two? You can't separate justification and sanctification. People don't walk around with 
Christ's righteousness clothing them, and yet they live like the devil. At least they can't do that for very long because there must be sanctification. There must be holiness of life. There must be Christ-likeness. If we are truly trusting in the Lord, he is working that image in us. The Bible says Jesus kept the commandments in order that he might give to us a perfect record of obedience. The Ten Commandments are what the Lord calls us to keep as well, but he gives us the power to do this by our trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we do that, it shows that we have received that righteousness of Christ. We are just in God's eyes. Now, Paul may have likened that righteousness to a breastplate because this is essentially what protects our spiritual life, our vital organs, as it were. We are saved by the righteousness of Jesus, and that alone, that is our protection against the attacks of the enemy. That is our protection against, we might even say, God's judgment. We're safe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not our works, but the works of Jesus. And there is nothing that is more deadly to saving faith than the belief that we need to enter heaven through our own works. We're warned against that again and again in Scripture. Paul tells us in Romans 11, verse 6, but if it, that is salvation, is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And then he says to the Galatians in Galatians 5, 4, which I didn't include in the slides, which is fine. He says, you have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. Now, Paul was addressing this to uh, the, the Galatian believers who were listening to the Judaizers, who were telling them, yes, you need to believe in Jesus, but you also need to keep the law. You need to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, and if you're not, Jesus isn't going to be enough for you. You're going to be lost. Paul is saying, if you believe that, and if you begin to trust in your circumcision, trust in your obedience, plus Jesus Christ, he says, you've been severed from Christ. You have fallen from grace because grace and works are two opposing principles. It's no wonder that the enemy is continually attacking that particular truth that we are saved by grace through faith alone. Paul's telling us that we need to hold on to that principle and that there is also no true justification without sanctification. If we are truly believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be living a life that is consistent with that, a life that is like that of Jesus. We will be devoting ourselves to him, knowing his will and going that direction. Not perfectly by any means. There'll be a struggle. But that will be the general direction of our lives. Now, thirdly, Paul says we must put on the shoes or the sandals, shod your feet, he says, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And here, again, there's a variety of ideas of what this can actually mean. Uh, it could mean that we'd be ready to share the gospel at all times. The message which alone the Lord uses to reconcile people to himself, to bring peace between uh, man and God. But of course, if Paul here is talking about sharing the gospel, then He's essentially making this into an offensive weapon rather than a defensive uh, piece of armor, and it essentially makes it the same thing as the sword of the Spirit. So it could mean that. I'm not going to say it doesn't mean that. It could also mean that we are to arm ourselves with the preparedness or the readiness to share the gospel of peace, but be ready also to endure whatever we have to endure as we do that. In other words, be ready to suffer for the sake of the gospel. As we do the work Jesus calls us to do, the Great Commission, make disciples of all the nations. And we do it in the way in which he's called us to do it, not by mailing Bibles across the, the, uh, the oceans, as it were, to foreign countries or leaving Bibles. And I mean, we can do that, but that's not the only way. Uh, but as we live like Christ, and as we share with people the message of the gospel, uh, 
uh, when we show them Christ through our works of love and mercy, which are not saving works, but the evidences of salvation, as we stand out as followers of Jesus Christ, we will suffer. Again, reminding you of what uh, Ferguson said earlier, the, the Jews did not kill Jesus because he was like them. They killed Jesus because he was different than they are. And Jesus says, likewise, to his disciples in the upper room, that if you are like me, then you are going to be hated like I am hated. So our Lord tells us we need to be ready and prepared to suffer for the sake of the gospel. So that's another thing it could mean. But it could also mean that we need to be firmly convinced, that we need to be firmly convinced that the gospel is the only way that we or anyone else can have peace with God. In other words, prepare ourselves with this, with this conviction that this is the only way. Now, these last two possibilities, the idea that we must be willing to suffer, it's the only way that people can be reconciled, might explain why Paul places it at the very foundation of the armor on our feet. If we're not firmly grounded in this, if we're not firmly convinced that the gospel is the only way to have peace with God, then are we going to be willing to fight for it? Are we going to be willing to share it if we don't believe that that person really needs to hear it? And isn't that where the enemy usually attacks us when we go to share the gospel? Now, maybe they've heard it somewhere else. Maybe they're already a Christian. Maybe the gospel isn't the only way. I mean, there's all kinds of ideas that the enemy can interject in our minds. We have to be settled in the fact that it is the only way. And again, as I've said, the enemy attacks that continually. Now, fourthly, he says, in addition to all, in verse 16, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now, if you've um, been in a war with a shield, which I don't think any of us have, or you've seen that portrayed perhaps in film, you know the shield is used to deflect swords, to deflect spears, to deflect arrows, to, to protect you. The kind of shield that Paul here is talking about is the kind that was used by the Romans, which wasn't a small circular shield, which is kind of what we usually think, but rather a large rectangular shield that he could actually squat behind and, and have full body protection. We also know from at least some studies that these shields were also coated with particular kinds of substances that might be able to put out what might be coming their way. And very often the enemy, when they're shooting things at you, would tip their arrows with something that's flammable in the hope of um, injuring you more severely than what the arrow was able to do. If you have a you know, flaming arrow stuck to your side, that's going to do more damage than merely an arrow. Now, the connection here to spiritual warfare is certainly clear. Our enemy attacks with weapons that he knows are going to be the most effective against us. Against, remember, Paul says we're not ignorant of the schemes. Thomas Brooks points out in his book, Precious Remedies, that Satan is the master fisherman, and he knows what bait to dangle in front of you and in front of me, and he knows how to, how to hide the hook in that golden bait and so forth and get us to go for it. He knows what is going to be most effective against us, and so he is going to send out his fiery darts. He's going to appeal to our lusts. He's going to appeal to our vanities, our desire for the things that he knows we want, that we shouldn't have, the things that will set our souls on fire, the things that would kill us if it weren't for the Lord's love and his promise to keep us. And the Lord will keep us, and he will not let Satan have us if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus. But faith is the shield that can deflect these attacks of the enemy. Faith in the promises of God to give us grace to resist the devil. Faith in the Lord Jesus to protect us as our captain. A faith that gives to us a clear view of what's really at stake here. 
the glories of heaven, the horrors of hell. We need a strong faith, which will not only give to us an impenetrable shield, but faith will also strengthen the other parts of the armor. So the shield of faith. Fifthly, Paul tells us to take up the helmet of salvation. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, he, he gives us a little bit more about this, which he may be referring to here as well. But he says, but since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, you know, the helmet covers and protects the head from injury. And perhaps in the same way, the hope of salvation guards our minds from despair. The enemy's lies, as I told you, are geared not only at attacking the gospel of grace and getting us to trust in ourselves and our good works to be right with God, Satan also works in the Christian to try to destroy our hope of heaven, that we're ever going to arrive in heaven, and he does it by attacking our assurance, the assurance that we belong to him, the assurance that God is true to his word and he's going to do what he said. The assurance that, that if we've trusted in him, we ultimately are safe. I mean, there are those who believe, and it's widespread throughout the evangelical church. Satan can still snatch you out of God's hand. You're, you're not really safe at any moment. But that isn't the case. You see, he wants to shake our idea of safety, that we're safe in the Lord, that we have this hope, and keep us in despair so that we will be neutralized in this warfare, but the helmet of salvation is the helmet of the hope of salvation, that we are safe in the Lord. And if we, are, if we know that we're safe, that will keep us from despair, and it will give us the hope that we will be with the Lord in heaven one day by His grace. So the helmet of salvation, perhaps the idea that the, the knowledge that we are in the Lord will keep us from despair. Now, these are the defensive weapons, as I've said, God's truth to give us our marching orders, the wisdom we need to use the different parts of the armor, the righteousness which comes from the Lord Jesus Christ on the basis of faith by which God declares us to be just, as well as a life that's consistent with that, a life of holiness that shows that we really do have His life and His righteousness, the preparation of the gospel of peace, which is essentially standing in the conviction the gospel is the only way of salvation to keep us engaging the battle, faith that is able to deflect the lies of the enemy, his deceptions, and hold on to the promises of God, and the hope of salvation that keeps us from despairing about what might happen to us in the future so that we can focus on the battle. You know, if you spend all your time wondering whether you're a Christian, you never really move forward. You never really engage in the battle. You never really grow because you're still at square one. Have I trusted Jesus or haven't I? Am I safe or not? The helmet of salvation helps us to move forward. Now, this is what Paul says we must take up in their entirety. We have to strengthen all of these different virtues so that we can stand strong against the evil one. Now, Paul also, and you, I'm sure you've all heard this before, but I thought I would bring in because it's, I think it's a very good point. He reminds us through the description of this armor that the only way that it allows us to move us forward, I think you've, you've heard that before, Bunyan notes this in his Pilgrim's Progress when Christian confronts or is confronted by Apollyon, and here's a quote from Pilgrim's Progress. He says, now Christian had not gone far in this valley of humiliation before he was severely tested for he noticed a very foul fiend coming over the field to meet him. His name was Apollyon. At this, Christian became afraid and immediately pondered whether he ought to retreat or stand his ground. But on further consideration, he realized that he had no armor on his back, and therefore to expose himself there and fleeing would probably give this foe the advantage with his use of piercing darts. So he determined to risk confrontation with the enemy, for he further thought, if I only had in mind the saving of my life, then it would still be best to stand my ground. Now, 
The enemy, as we've already heard many times, will certainly try to intimidate us, and that's what Apollyon was doing with regard to, to Christian, to make us turn back. Apollyon, remember, wanted Christian to go back to where he began, back to the city of destruction, to turn away from the Lord. Satan is going to come against us to try to get us to, back, to go back to the world. But we can move forward. As a matter of fact, we might say we have to move forward in the strength the Lord supplies and in the armor he has given to defend us, his intent is that we move forward. And that's the only safe direction is forward, not turning around and going the other way. Now finally and briefly, let's consider the two offensive weapons. And that's in verses 17 and 18. Paul says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Now, I'm including here, of course, the, um, the sword of the Spirit and prayer. Soldiers were equipped with at least one weapon to injure or to kill their opponents. In this case, Paul is referring to the sword. The Lord has given us a sword in this battle. It's called the sword of his word. Now, in our warfare, we can't kill the enemy. The Lord is going to deal with the enemy in his time, but he does want us to use the word to repel him. Now, again, drawing upon uh, Pilgrim's Progress, you may recall that Christian had a sword in his battle against Apollyon that he eventually was able to use to drive him away. So Bunyan here describes the conclusion of the battle. And I want you to notice that when, when he picks up the sword and he thrusts it into Apollyon, that he is quoting the scriptures. That's the way our Lord Jesus Christ repelled the enemy. When he came against him with his temptations, he replied with the word of God. We need to be able to use the word skillfully against him. So this is what we read. At this point, Christian began to despair of staying alive. This is the very end of the battle. But as God would have it, while Apollyon was preparing his final blow so as to destroy this good man, yet Christian was enabled to nimbly stretch out his hand and regain a grip on his sword. At the same time, he cried out, Do not rejoice against me, O my implacable enemy, for when I fall, I shall yet arise. Then he gave Apollyon a deadly thrust which caused him to draw back as if he had received a fatal wound. Now, in perceiving this, Christian moved in upon him while declaring, even so, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. As a result, Apollyon quickly spread out his dragon's wings and fled away so the Christian saw him no more. We may not be able to kill the enemy, but we need to resist the enemy with the word of God. And if we do, he will flee. Now, the word for sword here refers to a large, two-edged knife or dagger, not a long you know, saber or what we might call you know, a, a sword that kind of keeps the enemy at, at bay. Uh, the typical soldier was equipped with this kind of a weapon. And it was meant for, as you might guess, close combat. Paul is telling us that we need to be prepared to fight in close quarters with the enemy. He gets pretty close. And be able to use the word skillfully, which you have to do if you have a rather short object versus a long one, which you can just kind of flail wildly. You have to use it more pointedly to fight against the enemy and his attacks. So we need to resist him with the word of God until he runs away from us, as James writes in James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And then finally, Paul says we need to, to pray. He says in verse 18, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Now here Paul is dropping the, you know, the armor and weapon analogy, and he's telling us straightforward. We need to pray. We need to pray for ourselves by the power of the Holy Spirit that we might be strengthened with the power of Christ through the Spirit so that we might be able to stand strong against the enemy. And it makes a difference 
Whenever we pray according to the will of God, we know that He hears us and He gives us what it is we have asked. We need to pray is such a huge difference in the things that we do. If we ask for the Lord's blessing rather than just plowing into it without asking, we want the Lord's help. We need to pray. And we need to pray, he says, for one another, that we all might be able to do the same thing, that we might be able to be strong, put on that armor, be able to use those weapons effectively. So to wrap all this up, may the Lord help us to do these things. To strengthen ourselves in the Lord, in His Spirit. Remember, He has the limitless resources, the strength we need to do what He calls us to do, to be able to, to stand. We need to call upon Him. We need to put on His armor. We need to grow in these spiritual graces. We need to become skillful in using His Word. We need to know what it means. We need to be able to apply it. We need to be able to use it against the temptations of the enemy. Really, our enemies are all trying to undermine the Word. That's why we need the Word. We need to know what it actually says so that when these false ideas come, we recognize them and we can immediately repel them with the truth. Know the Word of God, use it skillfully, and we need to give ourselves to prayer, to seek the Lord continually for ourselves and for one another so that together we might stand in Him against the enemy, against the world, the devil, and our flesh. And in doing so, that we might be used by Him to help others also find their way out of the devil's kingdom, which is a kingdom of everlasting destruction, into the Lord's kingdom of eternal life. We have to be what the Lord calls us to be before we're going to be able to help other people find their way to the Lord Jesus Christ. So may the Lord help us all to be faithful soldiers in His army, well-equipped and ready to do His work. Let's, um, let's spend just a moment in prayer, shall we, and ask that the Lord would give us the grace to do this.